this is actually the second iteration of our social marketing campaigns. Our first was Good to Know. Um, there are quite a few states as well as um, uh, municipalities in Canada who have adopted Good to Know as their initial campaign efforts. The idea behind that was to say, well, whether you choose to use or not, it's always good to know. So what are the laws? What are the health effects? How can we have this conversation in an open, friendly, and approachable way? Because after 100 years of prohibition, government was not a trusted source of information about marijuana. Surprising, right? So once our, we moved through our first three years of, um, of the social marketing campaign of how do we make sure that everybody in Colorado, including those that are visiting, know the laws and know uh, the potential health effects of using marijuana, particular to each audience, we have transitioned to Responsibility Grows Here, which is our second iteration. And actually, if you look to other states um, that are in kind of the same um, History of uh, legalization, Oregon and Washington have some very similar campaigns with responsibility being this core message. So what we really looked at, oh, no, sorry. Can you stay in that first one? So we have a couple of different audiences. Um, uh, retailers and marijuana users and consumers is uh, one of our focuses of how do you talk to those who are using marijuana so they know specific safety sensitive things about their use. So not using while driving, um, not using in, in the public, that it's against the law, and it's also your responsibility to have clean air in our community and shared spaces. We also have a uh, campaign for pregnant and breastfeeding women about specific considerations for this population that we approach directly to women as well as clinicians that work with pregnant and breastfeeding women. And then youth and trusted adults, which we're going to focus on today. So this is our youth campaign. It's directly to young people. Um, our, all of our campaigns is about prevention. So find your moment. We really looked at how do we talk to young people in a way that is not just say no? We know that scare tactics do not work. The research bears this out. We want to be able to talk to young people not just about the potential harms of marijuana, but focusing on what are the protective factors that prevent young people from using substances, including marijuana and other substances like alcohol, prescription drugs, um, and uh, support them throughout their lives. So Find Your Moment was a <laughs> Find Your Moment was our campaign um, answer to that. How do you talk to young people that say, what are your goals? What are the things that you want in your life? How do we help you figure out what's going to help you get there and what could keep you from getting there or prevent you from that path on your way? So we really talked about what are you passionate about? Let's find your moment. So we're going to share this quick video. It's a 15 second spot that our partners at Amelie Company, who are here today up front on the top, little shout out to our friends if you wanna talk about the creation of this campaign. This is the moment I knew. Weed would not get in my way. All of our, this 15 second spot, we often use these as YouTube pre-rolls. It's all digital spaces for young people. That's where they're at. One of our public health communication lessons learned, as well as what the CDC recommends, is go to where your audience is. Um, and so our campaign has been predominantly digital and in those spaces where young people are. The formation of this campaign really came from talking to young people from the research of what we know about young people, what communication efforts work with young people, and what they told us. They told us that um, they did not want to hear uh, health stats and statistics and information in our could be linked to um, statements from public health sound like propaganda to them, their words. Um, direct quote from a young person, actually. This is sounding like propaganda. They did not want to have that conversation with us, or hear about us. They wanted to have that with trusted adults in their lives. We go to the next one. Oh, here's a couple digital banners. Oh, before I actually move on to the trust adults, all of these are Colorado young people. These are actually their passions. Um, and, act, and part of that has been to showcase what young people in Colorado are doing, but also have been become digital influencers of check out my YouTube pre-roll, my spot, my banner of this is me doing what I really love to do. And that prevents me from using marijuana and other substances. So remember campaign tactics again, like I said, we are predominantly in the digital space. Oh, oh, I guess we cut that one. 
So the, trust, the other campaign um, that we talk about is when we talk about youth prevention, it's really twofold. We talk directly to young people and we talk to the trusted adults in their lives because we know that having a connection to a trusted adult is a strong protective factor for young people, whether it's using marijuana or other substances and alcohol um, about mental health uh, promotion as well. There's a lot of researchers, research that is telling us that those connections to adults in their lives, whether it's a parent, a coach, a teacher, um, that they can be powerful influences in the lives of young people about what their choices are. And that's where we have a lot of our conversations with young people about how, what are the known health effects, what are the laws, what are the things you need to know uh, to make informed health decisions. All right, thanks, Jess. Appreciate that. And uh, one thing about it is, with the state, what the state of Colorado has been doing this before even us at the city of Denver, uh, we started doing this. Um, they they jumped on board and, they, and they've been uh, they've been great as far as uh, uh, having a lot of success and finding new ways to reach kids that aren't, as Jess said, the straight back from the 1980s because just say no and your brain on drugs. It's just not working. When we started out, the city of Denver, uh, we knew uh, that we needed to have some sort of campaign. So when we first started out, we actually partnered with the state of Colorado. We didn't have our own campaign. Uh, and that was, as Jess uh, talked to you about, uh, their first campaign in the state of Colorado was called Good to Know. And so uh, we worked with them. We put in some financial support for the first few years for Good to Know. And then in 2016, we also hired Amelie, because they do such a great job, uh, to develop a Denver-specific campaign. And that campaign, is called high costs. Uh, and to take a look here at the campaign development, just kind of the strategy and how we did it, it's 12 to 17 year olds in the city and county of Denver. Uh, and, and as you see here, the problem and trying to make sure that uh, kids know that, in, at least in Denver, that uh, using marijuana is, is, not a social, is not a social norm. Because a lot of kids think it is a social norm, but the fact is, uh, according to the stats, 79% of kids don't use marijuana. And so we want to make sure they knew that, that uh, this isn't a social norm to, to use marijuana or cannabis. Uh, and we want to prevent uh, uh, and educate youth. Uh, the review process, so we went through a, a large review process to develop this campaign. We had surveys uh, where we had 154 youth, uh, Denver 12 to 17 years old. Um, go back one more, yeah, I, I'm the one before. Uh, we did desktop research on the industry, uh, teen usage rates, uh, Colorado specific guidelines. Uh, and we also review past campaigns because it's important to take a look at what had been done uh, before uh, so we can make sure to see what was effective, what wasn't effective. And we also had a youth commission, uh, 15 kids ages 12 to 17 over uh, three sessions so we could hear from them. It's important to hear from them. Uh, and we had community concept testing where we partnered uh, with our office here in Denver of Children's Affairs that Daniel works with very closely uh, to test concepts with youth across Denver. Uh, 52 youths at uh, different ages and, and genders uh, and uh, so we can understand uh, their perspective because we want them to understand the high costs so they can make decisions uh, for themselves. Uh, the, the interesting thing is uh, kids unfortunately they listen to their parents more than they uh, listen to uh, sorry, they listen to their friends more than they listen to their parents. I got that backwards there. Uh, so, 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 I wish they listened to their kids or their parents more than they listen. But anyway, so we wanted to give them the information they needed to be able to, when they're talking with their friends, to make educated choices. Uh, so when their friend says, I don't use marijuana because, and, and that's really what that's the, the, the high cost uh, is all about. Uh, Denver uh, uh, campaign focused uh, to make sure they understand those high costs, whether it be um, you know, how it impacts brain development, whether it be how you can lose a college scholarship because marijuana is illegally federally, uh, those high costs that affect them, or lose a driver's license. These are things that get to teens. It's not scare tactics, it's just facts, so they understand it. Let's take a look at the campaign overview, just kind of where this campaign's at. We want to make sure we were reaching kids where they're at, and that's uh, with billboards on uh, school buses, uh, billboards around locations of schools, um, digital radio and video because kids are online, uh, social media, you'll see up here it says Facebook and Instagram, but uh, we're everywhere there is on uh, social media. Snapchat's one we've really been focusing on, especially going forward because that's what kids do these days. Man, I sound old when I say that. Uh, we also have a game called Classroom in a Box where uh, we, uh, it's, a, it's a card game. It looks almost like a Uno card set and it has these facts. And you're going to learn probably a little bit more about that as we go on today. Uh, but we're distributing that in uh, different after-school programs. 
Uh, and uh, we have rack cards uh, that we uh, give out at uh, city events. And of course the website, uh, thehighcost.com. But you see, it kind of gets, it gets the message. 70, that was, I guess, the older number, 74%. But uh, the majority of kids are not using uh, marijuana. And also, there you go, with the message about your tuition is gone and how the high cost of it. Um, next up here, we have the game show. So we had to create content to distribute on these social media channels and, and online and in digital. And uh, we uh, created a game show called Weed It Out. It was actually my first week I was here. I showed up in Amelie, and they were taping a game show. And I went, wow, what are they doing here in Denver? This is, uh, this is different. And so uh, we had kids, only Denver kids, who participated in the game show. And, and uh, we, we created this content with approximately 200 questions asked, addressing health, legal, and social effects. Uh, we had uh, the game show has three rounds of bleacher, uh, semifinals, and a final conversation. We had a winner who got a trophy, and this, the uh, contestants were 13 to 17 years old. And it just created some sound bites. It's not, we don't air the whole game show on social media because we needed to create 15 second, 30 second bites, 60 second bites, um, where, where you could play these on social media, and maybe hopefully it would get shared and would create engagement and get kids talking about it and uh, wanting to learn the facts. And uh, B is going to here, going to push the button here. We're going to show you one Welcome example of it. Weed it out, Denver's Welcome to Weed It Out, Denver's very first game show about marijuana. Tell me this: What percentage of Denver high school students do not use marijuana? Marijuana, 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 marijuana. All right, we have a true or false question. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I like to do comedy occasionally in Denver, but it reaches people, you know, and it makes them uh, put their defenses the down a little bit so they can, talk about it they, can, they can see it. And this next video is one that I really enjoyed, one of my favorite aspects of it, because after we shot the game show, we set the kids down, and we wanted them to talk about their attitudes towards marijuana. And this is kind of one of the segments we did, once again, ending that perception among kids that they think everyone's doing it, which they're not. I feel like kids should talk about it with each other just to get a census of what their peers think. 74% of teens aren't doing marijuana, so I think having those conversations helps you understand that it doesn't make you cool and you're not. And that's weeded out. So you should go to thehighcost.com is the website if you're interested in checking out more of the videos and kind of seeing the, the full picture of it because there's lots of these videos. And there's also uh, Facebook on uh, Twitter, uh, YouTube and so on where you can uh, watch these and hopefully learn something from it and as you guys do education campaigns um, you know hopefully you can steal some of our good ideas and maybe come up with some good ideas of your own that we can steal from you because we'd love to steal your ideas uh, if we could and before we move on I'm just curious in this audience how many people have have a youth education campaign from these cities or states anyone yet anyone it's good a few of you a few of you have started that that's great. Well, what was uh, number two on the, uh, the list here? We'll have to go back to our voting, go back to the latest polls. So the question often is, especially post-legalization, what is public health's role in retail marijuana? Um, we often get that question. Um, it's particularly at the beginning. Um, how is our message not just don't do drugs, right? And we know when we think about the public health approach, our job really is to change the environment in which we live. And so there are many policies that are involved in that that help support that, um, that conversation. Uh, but Colorado, what we see as our job is to enact the will of the people while preserving public health. In Colorado, retail marijuana was um, part of our state constitution, so it was actually a constitutional right in Colorado to have an ounce of marijuana on you. Now how do you have a conversation about that with having your constitutional right and preserving public health? So our job is to educate for safe, legal, and responsible use. So part of uh, this work uh, at the very beginning was coordination of multiple state agencies. Our lessons learned and recommendations for other states is often get all of your people at the table. Who are your contacts in other state agencies and the local agencies? Who are your stakeholders to get to the table to have those conversations? Because though this may feel scary, overwhelming, um, and you don't really know what it's going to come out to when once, depending on what the laws look like, what the regulation shakes out to be, really you've got the expertise already internally. 
marijuana legalization is new. Marijuana itself is not new. Our history, our expertise in um, ensuring that DUI enforcement, covering public health approaches to substance use prevention, these are not new concepts to us and there is a rich history and deep expertise in all of your agencies. Tap those people, bring them to the table to bring that to how, how to make sure that you set up the environment in your state or in your county municipality to preserve public health health. Thank you. Part of our big role is to improve data reporting and health monitoring. This is the number one recommendations we make to other states. It is very difficult to answer the question of how has legalization impacted your communities if you don't have data pre-legalization to look to. That was one of our questions and concerns was that we didn't have very strong data because nobody was looking at it before. Um, now people are looking and so we have more funding to support that. We have um, a very robust data collection uh, process here which sounds very dry, but when you get to how do you answer the question of what is the impact that we're seeing, if you don't have data, you're missing a very big part of that story. Um, data can only tell you part of that story. The rest is uh, what is your perception? What are we seeing? What are the stories that are happening here? But if you don't look to what do we really see, when we ask, for example, when we ask young people, how many young people are using marijuana? About 80% of them will say, well, yeah, everybody is. When we ask parents, they say the exact same thing, just not my kid, right? Um, but when we look to actually who is using marijuana, four to five Colorado youth are not using marijuana. That is not the perception. Um, that is not the perception among young people. That is not the perception among parents. But our data is showing us that this is actually the reality that our young people are living in. So how do we make sure to bring that to the forefront and have data inform our policies, practices, and procedures? The other component we had is health monitoring, so looking at hospitalization data, emergency department visits, uh, poison control data, as well as what are the known health effects. You know, there is one federal place where it is legal to study the health effects of marijuana, um, and uh, that is pretty far behind when we think about tobacco, alcohol, some other substances that we've had for a long time, um, some known health effects or known um, even benefits of some of these substances. We're at least 50 years behind knowing what some of the health monitoring um, effects of, of marijuana can be in our communities. And so now that it is legal, what do we know? How do we make sure that um, one study that is cherry picked and used by um, organizations on either side, stakeholders on either side of the agenda, how do we make sure that that's not the running narrative? So what do we actually know about the health effects of marijuana? So we have a health monitoring team, advisory board of professionals um, and health uh, care professionals and clinicians who look at emerging research and weigh it across the spectrum. Is this a good study? Is this a valid study? What does this study in compared to the landscape look like? And that informs all of our public health uh, messaging and approaches. Because as you know, you Google marijuana, it's going to kill you or it's going to cure everything that tells you, right? So where is the truth? Probably somewhere there in the middle. Uh, so our next big topic is policies to prevent youth access. Um, this is um, quite a difficult subject to talk about because there's no known policy that prevents youth access for marijuana that's research-based because we've never had legal marijuana or policies about that, right? So in the absence of that, what do we look to? We have 50 odd years of, al of alcohol and tobacco prevention resources um, and policy that shows us what this looks like. What are good policies in our communities? We in public health have stolen from marketing the four Ps, right? Those of you that have especially worked in tobacco control or prevention are familiar with this. It is product, placement, promotion, and somebody help me with the fourth one? Place, thank you. Mm -hmm. So when you think about what that means, what are the products, so what are the regulations and uh, enforcement of those regulations that inform what is in the product? Is there a potency cap? Is there a, what are the labeling and requirements that are on the, and packaging that's on that that we've learned from other substances? When you look at promotion, how is advertising available? We know that advertising of um, alcohol and tobacco has can have a major effect on young people. What do we know that we can apply to marijuana? When you look at place, 
Um, where can uh, marijuana be sold? In Colorado, we have a very tight um, regulatory system for marijuana. It is not the same for alcohol or tobacco. Um, and we have made major wins from the get-go for marijuana that tobacco and alcohol have been working for the last 25 years to get. Um, when we think about, what was my fourth one? Uh, help me out here, usually in front of me. Price. What is the price? So are there, what are your state and local taxes look like? How do you balance that local tax and state tax with driving folks to the black market? You will never get rid of the black market. It will likely always be there, no matter how strict of a regulatory system you have for retail marijuana. So how do you ensure that you are um, keeping a price that has been known to prevent youth access in, in, to marijuana, um, excuse me, to tobacco, and apply that to marijuana without driving undue influence to the black market. Our third big topic for this, our multi-pronged approach is this public education. As I mentioned before, <laughs> our first um, education campaign was Good to Know. Uh, this is iteration of our first launches. We had the Good to Know launch. Um, we had some TV spots, talked to trusted adults and young people, and then dove into different audiences. As I mentioned before, there are public health communication practices about what is the best way to approach um, different audiences about substance use prevention. And one of the primary things is segment your audiences. The same message is not going to work for those who use marijuana of, as it's going to work for youth. When you're in public health communications and efforts, it is a struggle to find that line of how do I have a message of prevention an abstinence for young people and a message of use safely for marijuana consumers in the same marketplace. So making sure that your message is not stepping on the other as well as adhering to what our known up-to-date scientific best practices are and what the research shows. It is a struggle. I highly recommend hiring a fantastic um, marketing company if you're looking to do state or um, local mass marketing campaigns. All right, thanks, Jessica. That was really great to hear uh, what the state of uh, Colorado is doing. Uh, from a Denver perspective, if you've been to a few of these sessions, one thing you've learned that we talk about frequently, often, and you're probably sick of us talking about it at this conference, is about our coordinated approach, how we work with many different agencies. We're often asking, you know, what's the most important thing you can do to regulate marijuana? A coordinated approach. Well, that also is the case when it comes to youth education and prevention. Usually when you see a bunch of things like this, it's a pyramid scheme. No, this is not a pyramid scheme. This is a actually uh, our coordinated approach, our five-prong approach, we call it, uh, with uh, uh, how, we're do how we're accomplishing our, our goals here. You'll see at the top there, uh, youth prevention programs. Uh, that's our Office of Children's Affairs. Uh, they do a lot of after-school education, trusted adults, uh, really, really viable work. Uh, you'll see youth diversion programs, our Office of Behavioral Health. They have a really challenging job in that uh, they, they work on diversion. And so kids who unfortunately have gotten off of the yellow brick road, they're trying to get them back on that yellow brick road. They do, they do an outstanding job. Uh, you have our uh, public awareness campaigns, and that really uh, is to make sure that people are educated as far as, uh, that's just not kids, but just what the laws are. So you know, people know what the legal age is to uh, consume. Uh, they, they understand what the rules are in the city of Denver as far as consuming marijuana. Uh, we have data collection, and this is one of the most important areas, and I think it's uh, also one of the most challenging areas when it comes to marijuana regulation, because there just isn't a lot of health statistics out there. And that's through uh, a, a local hospital, Denver Health, and they collect uh, important facts as far as what's going on, as far as data collection. They've worked really closely with us and done a great job. And then lastly, we have our mass marketing campaign, which is the high cost campaign, which uh, you just learned about just a few minutes ago. I'm going to talk for a minute about uh, the revenue we have here in Denver. If you went to uh, the uh, finance one, you probably learned a little about this, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time about this. But what you'll see is uh, where, where the money coming in from De for, for uh, the city of Denver. And marijuana makes, revenue makes up less than 4% of tax revenue in Denver. A lot of people thought when we had legalized marijuana that maybe the streets would be paid with gold. Well, that is not the case. It's, it's, it's great money. We're really appreciative of that, but it makes up a very small 
portion of our overall tax income. And, and, and if you look at uh, where it's coming from, uh, the sales tax as far as uh, uh, the special sales tax of 3.5%, which it used to be until October 1st when it just changed to 5.5%. This gives you kind of an idea where the money's coming from so we can afford these, uh, uh, these education campaigns. And that special sales tax, uh, that's really dedicated uh, entirely to, uh, uh, at least that's where we get our funds for the, uh, the education efforts in the uh, city and county of Denver. Uh, here's a better look at the uh, 2017 uh, breakdown. Uh, oh, slide's not working, okay. Not sure what happened there. We, it wasn't meant to be in Russian, I swear. Uh, that uh, the retail sales tax made up 31%, that 5.5%, uh, what I told you about, for yeah. recreational marijuana. Uh, there's also, uh, uh, for medical uh, sales tax, just a regular sales tax, that made up uh, 17%. Uh, licensing fees that we have for marijuana businesses makes up 11%. That's in the green you see right there. And then the yellow, uh, you have a state share back. We get a percentage of the state, the taxes that's charged by the state, and that makes up 17 percent. Uh, second on the pie chart is the the retail special uh, retail se special tax. That's actually the five point. Sorry, the the, the uh, special tax we have, the retail sales tax, the regular tax. But that's 29 percent. So that gives you kind of an idea of uh, of the money that's coming in uh, as far as the revenue we're using and really uh, distributed towards education. And that multi prong approach, which we keep pounding in your head, uh, this gives you an idea where this money is going and and uh, where. Uh, like the Office of Behavioral Health that I talk about, uh, at part of what they're doing, 7%. Uh, uh, really important Office of Children's Affairs, part of our education efforts. That's 17%, uh, you'll see there. Denver Health, what I talked about, getting that uh, information, that health information so people can make good decisions, 2%. My office, the Office of Marijuana Policy, coordinating all these efforts is uh, at 17%. So it's really distributed, but you'll see a lot of different agencies on here. Once again, it's that multi-prog approach that we found so successful, multiple agencies working together and uh, making sure they're all funded so we can do that. Uh, and then just the budget history, we'll see we're devoting uh, more and more money towards education. This is a priority in Denver. Our mayor led the way and he has said that uh, making sure that our youth are not using marijuana, that prediction that people said who were scared about legalization, we want to make sure that was not going to happen. And that's why you'll see as uh, the money went up from 2014 to 2018. And the first part, when 2014, we really didn't know how much money was going to come in. We didn't know. So when we were budgeting, we budgeted very conservatively. And, uh, and then as we've learned how much money is coming in from taxation of marijuana, uh, the budgets have increased. And uh, as you see here, uh, 3.6 million uh, in 2018 dedicated to education. Uh, obviously enforcement regulation, that three pillars of how you manage marijuana, uh, this is what you see right here. And uh, fortunately we've had the funds to really focus on uh, educating our kids, and educating uh, the populace. This breaks it down uh, even, even more to uh, some of the offices that are, uh, and where the spending goes for education and prevention efforts. And as you'll see here uh, in the uh, green, our Office of Children's Affairs is getting the uh, biggest chunk of it because they're doing free after school programs. It's not just a matter of teaching kids not to use marijuana, but getting them busy, giving them activities. And that's been proven, as you probably know, that when you give kids activities, they're bound to stay on the right road. Daniel's gonna talk about more of that and how important that is here in just a few minutes. Uh, you also see here that uh, we have uh, 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 Office of Marijuana Policy, OMP Education, Blue makes a big chunk of that here in 2018. And then uh, um, also uh, Behavioral Health, uh, we talked about them. Uh, so we're really distributing that from all areas to try to make sure we can accomplish all of our goals. And with that, I'll turn it over to Daniel. You finally get to speak, Daniel. <laughs> can everybody hear me, is this on? No. Can you hear me anyway if I speak like this oh, in the no, back? <laughs> Just the Just we'll change. switch mics here. All right, a little bit better? Yeah. A lot better, I heard. <laughs> okay, let me start by asking a question, a little pull of the audience. Who's a resident of the city and county of Denver? Raise your hand. Perfect. I hope you get some really nice speaking points out of this. For everyone else, I hope you're going to see a strategy that has been very successful in Denver. And if you'd like to talk about replicating it in your own community, it's fairly easy to do. It's fairly effective, and it seems to have a lot of good traction with our community members. So let me walk you through with these multiple microphones what it <laughs> looks like to support um, after school programs through marijuana tax um, revenue. As Eric mentioned just a couple slides ago, the Office of Children's Affairs, that's the mayoral kind of appointee to look after all sorts of children's um, affairs, really. Um, we get a portion of the funds to ensure that all youth have access to after-school programs. Well, why are after-school programs so important? I, you probably already know this. They operate between three to six. When are most youth unsupervised? Anybody? 
Three to six, okay. All right, everybody I think gets it in the room and why it's a really sensible strategy, but I wanna tell you about why it's a really sensi um, sensible protective factor strategy. So let me just walk through our kind of context really quick. In Denver, we have three really important things that we're always monitoring. One, it's the idea that Denver youth have a very low perception of harm compared to the state. That's important. The second is they're much more likely to use than their peers in the state marijuana before age 13. Very important. Third thing, dispensaries are three times more prevalent in the city and county of Denver than they are in the state. Denver has about a tenth of the population of Colorado. 30% of dispensaries are located in the boundary of the city and county of Denver. That's really important. These are the social norming cues that youth get when they're driving down some of our major boulevards with multiple dispensaries. Do not think that that doesn't have an impact on youth. It is latent, but it is there. So we wanted to kind of address this, and we said, okay, look, as a team, our challenge is to support youth marijuana prevention in a post-legalized landscape. Okay, this, this was crazy, but here's where we started. Bia, would you click through a couple? Okay, so our, our idea was, first of all, let's just give out of school time, that's the OST, let's just give them $10 a kiddo. Let's just, for every kiddo that they serve regularly, let's give them 10, 10 extra dollars. Um, we could offer marijuana classes to all sixth grade students, and we could create marijuana specific training for all out of school time staff. The issue that we came to is that that's not a targeted approach. It's a, what we call a shotgun approach. We'll make sure that everybody gets a little of something. As it turns out, and as Jess noted earlier, we have to think about our key target populations. We can't have a shotgun approach. It's not sensible, it's not safe, it's not efficient. And so how did we go about doing this? Yeah. Here's a map of the city and county of Denver. Does anyone notice anything? It's very colorful, thank you for saying that. You're almost a plant. It's very colorful, but it doesn't tell you anything. It tells you where some neighborhoods are, but it, tell, it doesn't tell you what's going on in those neighborhoods. It doesn't tell you where we should target funds. It just tells you what's a geographical representation of the city and county of Denver. You're so good. Let's take a look at this. What if we knew some of the really important factors that play a role in how youth make decisions around marijuana, how they make really important social norming cues around marijuana, and this is what we did. We started with this thing, and it's an index called the Child Well-Being Index, thank you. And we look at a few different ideas, concepts, data points where we can say these factors are related to the, um, to the factor that we are trying to impact, which is youth marijuana use. Okay, so we had some very, very easy ones. Health. We know that health is an asset, right? Health is an asset for every human. Next, we had educational kind of outcomes. So we know that if you're engaged in a, in a day school program consistently and doing well in school, that's an asset to you as an individual. Last one, we looked at economics. If you have the financial support as a youth, you have an asset to protect you against some decisions or to guide you in some decisions. These aren't, this isn't a perfect index, but it is an index that gives us a really clear strategy for how we wanted to invest these funds. Okay, Bia. This is investing with intent. And normally this is like a four hour presentation where we walk communities through, so. I appreciate it. Okay, so back one really quick. Okay, there's that colorful map again. Doesn't tell us anything. Let's hit it. This is the Child Wellbeing Index. A Little bit darker, that's limited opportunity for youth, okay? So we basically create an index, a bunch of z-scores for all the statistician wonks in the room. We just create a big index that ranks all of the neighborhoods from top to bottom, or from most opportunity to least opportunity. And here's what it looks like. The darker areas, limited opportunity for youth. Those health, education, and economic factors are limited. Next one. Here's what we did. We also said if we're trying to impact youth's perception and use of marijuana, we should probably look where those really critical factors are for social norming, dispensaries, and marijuana facilities. So then what we did is we mapped those over them. Next one, Bia. We then said, what are our priority neighborhoods for the city and county of Denver? This is kind of where it gets exciting, right? We said, these are the priority neighborhoods where we are going to invest in after school programs so that when youth don't have a place to go because their day school ends and their parents are still at work, 
They have a place to be safe. They have a place to be supported. They have a place to make healthy decisions, healthy relationships, all of the good things that after school does. And then finally, we made our investment based on this through a competitive grants process. Those are the yellow dots and those represent the size of the investment that we made in after school programs. So we went all the way from a really colorful map that didn't tell us anything to a really, really colorful map that told us where youth were um, having the context to succeed or some barriers to succeed. And then we overlaid our after school investments on top of those. This has been something that I am professionally the most proud of in my career because we are investing money towards a program that makes a difference in the lives of youth. So if you have a question about this, please know I will stick around. I will talk to your community about this. I will come out and talk to your community about this because I believe that this is a really, really powerful investment strategy. So for those of you representing municipalities, counties, even states, please talk to me about this because we can provide the background research and knowledge to make it a reality. It's actually not that hard and it's a great investment. Thanks. Well, we're gonna do, uh, so uh, we're, we're gonna have a chance to talk about uh, trusted adults and, and I believe that's you, Daniel. Gosh. If you speed this up, maybe we can make it anyway. You got it. So, <laughs> we'll do this one, and I'm going to even go faster than before, and we're going to play a game. How does that sound, everybody? <laughs> right on. Okay. Uh, you get to hear from me again. Isn't that exciting? Okay. This is preparing our workforce, and this is really what we're thinking about when we want youth to have access to after-school programs or to community members, adults that are really important in their lives. A lot of times the reason that they're poor, important in the lives of youth is because they're a trusted adult. And we use that term constantly in Denver and in Colorado. Trusted adult, trusted adult, trusted adult. It is such an important protective factor that you're going to hear it like 10 more times and I hope it's something that um, if you're not investing in already, that you could. Um, our local context is actually quite simple. We have a partnership through a CTC grant called Denver Partnership for Youth Success. We have these following stakeholders, including my colleague Bia here. She's one of our um, community members who um, basically we decided to host a big conference. I mean, this is really what I'm gonna tell you is that we hosted a big conference with the following goals, Bia. We said we wanted to have every adult in the city and county of Denver who has a relationship with youth have the following information. One, we wanted them to know how to have impactful conversations when it comes to marijuana. So it can't just be the just say no, or I'm really upset at you, it has to be an impactful conversation. So we practiced those for a whole day with about 150 individuals. Um, we wanted them to learn about the marijuana landscape in Denver. That was really important because a lot of the questions we get from our community members is, where, first of all, where's that darn marijuana money going, right? Hear that all the time. The second question is, well, what are you doing about it? And we said, why don't you just join us and be a partner in the success of Denver youth. So join us for a one day event and learn about the marijuana landscape in Denver. And then there's this really critical idea that there are actual skills when it comes to being a trusted adult. It's not just this like ethereal thing. If you think about the time that you spent, for example, with your soccer coach, with your drama teacher, there were actual, that, that you really loved and appreciated and learned to kind of, um, accept them as a trusted adult, there were actually very specific things that they did to make that a reality. There were very specific trusting conversations that they had with you to encourage you to build that relationship with them. Um, a lot of our youth service workers are a little bit on the younger side. For example, folks who work at Boys and Girls Club might be in their mid-20s. They may not have had the opportunity to build these deep relationships with youth. We wanted them to have a sense of what it would be like to have really meaningful trusting conversations with youth. So that's what we worked on for a whole day. Um, basically, it was a fantastic event and we wanted people to leave more confident in their ability to support youth, get new perspective on being a trusted adult. I'm not gonna read it to you, but these are the things that we worked on. These are the things that they got out of it. And we're gonna continue to work on this as a protective factor because as I was telling some of the um, audience members earlier, Behavior is something that we have a limited control on. Um, awareness is something that we have a limited control on. There's a lot going on in the lives of youth. But we think that if we can put as many trusted adults in the lives of youth, we have a really, really good opportunity and a strong chance of making a difference in the lives of um, youth 
in our community. And that's, that's really as simple as that. So that's our protective factor strategy. Why we're so proud of it is that this is something that's research-based. It's something that people buy into, and it's something that's really easy to explain to our community around why trusted adults are such an important part of our prevention community. Uh, so this slide is um, uh, actually some of our data. So from our Healthy Kids Colorado survey data, we as a state really focus on risk, shared risk and protective factors. So instead of approaching marijuana individually, what, how can we look at what are the common things for all of these risk behaviors that we look back and say, what are some protective factors that will prevent some of these things from happening? What are the shared risk factors that we can help mitigate? So really pulling the lens back to these upstream prevention. And our role as the state is not only to gather some of that data and information to inform efforts that are happening around the state, but also to fund some of those efforts. And how do you fund some of those efforts? It's calling attention to it first, right? So here is what we know. Parents' opinion matters. Parents' opinions matter, supportive teachers matters, and having a trusted adult to go to is are powerful protective factors in the lives of young people. And these are something that we focus on and we have specifically seen around marijuana use. We also see around multiple other substance use as well. So the incredible thing about that is, while if you are focusing your efforts on building the skills um, of those trusted adults, included, inclusive of parents, teachers, coaches, and other youth serving professionals, you are not only um, so building protective factors to prevent underage marijuana use, but building protective factors to um, increase mental health support, to decrease suicidal ideation, to in decrease alcohol, underage alcohol use and binge drinking. These protective factors are um, a really clear cut strategy to think about how do we really think about what's happening in the lives of young people and not just focus on one substance. Because we, we know that marijuana use doesn't happen in a vacuum. We know that alcohol use doesn't happen in a vacuum. So how do we think about the culture, the environment in which young people are living and setting that stage uh, from the get go. So part of our uh, approach is, Daniel had mentioned the CTC grant, it's Communities That Care, it's an evidence-based coalition and community um, building uh, practice. It is funded through marijuana tax cash dollars across the state, we're 40, uh, funding 47 counties out of the 64 in Colorado to prevent youth substance use through sustainable practices and identifying what each community feels is the most powerful use of that um, funding and efforts. Sometimes it's marijuana, sometimes it's having access to affordable childcare. Um, these ranges and policies about how we shape our environment and build those protective factors can be very powerful influences. So when we think about some of our other efforts, it's uh, how do we talk to those trusted adults um, across the state? So Your Words Have Power is our trusted adult social marketing and mass marketing campaign. How do we talk to those adults to say they know they need to have those conversations? Often what it ends up being is you're sitting outside of the grocery store, you lock the car, and you're like, well, we're going to talk about drugs real quick. And so our, our recommendation is the parents says, please don't do that. <laughs> and um, it's not a one and done. It's not a marijuana conversation. It's ongoing conversations that you have with your child, that you have with your student, that you have with um, your soccer player, right? Um, these are. These are skills that are built in trusted adults, but also ha have that conversation even though you don't have all the answers, because your words really do stick with young people. So um, B is gonna play a 30 second spot that we play um, targeted to trusted adults um, about your words have power, because we know that reminding adults to have those conversations uh, is that first step to get in the door. Your words have power. So when it comes time to talk to kids about marijuana, remember, you can impact their choices. Kids who have an adult they can talk to are less likely to use marijuana. Start talking and learn more at responsibilitygrowshere.com. How easy is it to have a conversation with a teenager? <laughs> about anything. 
It can seem very daunting. How easy is it for as public health officials to raise the alarm with adults to say, you should be terrified for your children. That is not an approach we want to take. Um, we are already pretty scared about what's happening with our, with our kids, right? There's no need to feed into that fear and raise those alarm bells. These are conversation that we sh conversations we should be having with young people about everything in their lives. And having that conversation, starting that conversation can seem very scary, but is a powerful protective factor to prevent youth substance use. These are some of our campaign tactics. Um, our trusted adult campaign is, has been transcreated in English and Spanish for our top two languages here in Colorado. Uh, we have digital banners, we do PR. Uh, we also have it on advanced TV, so if you've been watching Hulu or Netflix recently, you might have been served one of these ads. Um, and also, um, we have it all across our website. Again, a responsibility grows here. You can find our youth, uh, trusted adults, a clinician and pregnant and breastfeeding women campaigns as well as those for those who are marijuana consumers. And you get to play the game. <laughs> and I would also say, you know, Daniel and I, t we talk about, um, you know, we do these presentations very often. And these are about four to six hour presentations. So thank you for um, bearing with us in the high level kind of breeze through of these very deep to topics. Um, we are very happy to share with you our lessons learned. Um, that we are all in this work together and supporting each other to make sure that you learn from our mistakes as well as our successes. All right, well, thank you guys so much. And so we're gonna try to play a really, really fast version of our classroom in a box game. This is uh, part of the Denver's high cost campaign where we're trying to teach kids uh, the facts about marijuana so they have accurate peer-to-peer -peer conversations. And these, uh, along with our game show, which you saw weeded out, we also uh, distributed these, uh, these card games to schools and after school programs. And so they can play these games. Uh, and it's, um, most people that get these, you can change the rules however you want. You can make up different ways to play it. It's basically a trivia game about marijuana. Uh, if we had more time, we would do true and false. We have true and false questions. Uh, we have A, B, and C questions. And we uh, have high stakes questions, which are a little tougher. So I, before we get started, I have to ask the people here, who, raise your hand if you're from a market or from a, from a state or a city that's only had marijuana legal or is not legal in the last year. How many we got here? One, two, three. Okay, anyone who raised their hand over on this side, you have to come up over here and stand right here. Come on, come up, you gotta come up. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and start. What we're gonna do is we're gonna keep track of points and I'm gonna have Bia help us keep track. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask you some questions and you have to do A, B, C, or D. And uh, I'm going to have oh, you hold I it up and show the camera, A, B, C, or D. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's uh, I'll go ahead and ask the questions. I think, I think we should come up here. All right, well, we'll step up here. I think I, I, got a, I got a mic on so I can do it here. I'll walk up and... Yeah, it's, it's, I guess I am. I'm not as good as Bob Barker, though. I'm trying, but I'm not as good. Uh, so let's, uh, so what's your name? Uh, Kelly Donlin. Kelly, where are you from? Uh, Monterey, California. So we have a Californian here. So Kelly... Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to give me an A, uh, I'm just going to hand you the mic because I have a mic here and I'll let you pass it down. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question and it's, these are facts. These are, these are so kids understand the facts. So marijuana can affect blank time. A, stretching, B, reaction, C, coloring, or D, cooking. Marijuana can affect blank time. Is it A, stretching, B, reaction, C, coloring, D, cooking? I'm going to go with B, reaction. And you are correct. We have, uh, she got one point. Right. Daniel, I'm going to have you keep track of these here, all right? All right, so next up, uh, what's your name? Hi, my name is Lydia, and I live in Boulder, Colorado. All right, we got a Boulder right here. We have a Coloradan here. Lydia, here's, uh, what is secondhand smoke? A, smoke that is breathed in by someone who is near the person smoking. B, smoke from fire. C, smoke from an oven. Or D, smoke that is breathed in by the person smoking. I'm going to say A. And we have another run white. There we go. We have All a tie right. game here. Right. What's your name, sir? Jeffrey Shapiro. I'm from Los Angeles. All right, Jeffrey, great to have you here at the conference. In Colorado, 16,000 children are at risk of being exposed to blank at home. A, secondhand marijuana smoke. B, cheesy movies. C, chewing tobacco. Or D, vegetables. A. I'm going to go with A on that right one. There. Oh, I grabbed, I'm going to get you the harder ones now, I guess. Right, right, right. Thank you, Mia. Is it Sorry, because I'm from Denver? 
Okay, I know her name. She, her name is Erica. She works with me at the city of Denver, but she hasn't seen these questions. Don't worry. This, this is why this. I get the harder ones. <laughs> yes, yes, you get the harder ones. All right, so for which of the following conditions can you get a medical marijuana card in Colorado? A, insomnia, B, seizures, C, stress, or D, all of the above? I'm going to go with D, all of the above. You've been weeded out, unfortunately, Erica. But thank you for playing. <laughs> what is the answer? The answer is B, seizures. seizures. Yeah. Thank you, Erica, for playing. All right, what's your name? I'm Cheryl. I'm from Canada. Oh, we have a Canadian. Our friends in Canada. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Cheryl. Uh, which U.S. president repealed the Marijuana Tax Act? Was it A, Bill Clinton, B, Richard Nixon, C, Barack Obama, or D, none of the above. The Canadian asking us about U.S. presidents. Yeah. Which one are you going to guess on? I'm going to go with Obama. All right. And the answer is, unfortunately, you've been weeded out. Uh. B, Richard Nixon. But thank you for playing. It's great to have you here. <laughs> All right. What's your name? Hi, my name's Kimberly, and I'm also from Canada. All right. Well, uh, don't news, ask Kimberly. me about presidents, because I don't know. <laughs> I don't have. You're not getting a presidential question. So... Uh, but it is a U.S. question. Uh, of what did it is. the U.S. Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 require? I'm sure you were just studying this the other day. Uh, a. Lids for products that contain marijuana. B. Labels for products that uh, for products that contain marijuana. C. All marijuana products to be sold in pharmacies. Or D. None of the above. You want to repeat those for you? A. Uh, so what did what did the U.S. Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 require? 1906. A. Lids for products that contain marijuana. B. Labels for products that contain marijuana. So lids or labels. Okay. Or C. All marijuana products to be sold in pharmacies. Or D. None of the above. Take a guess. Let's go with D. Unfortunately, you no have been way. weeded out. But it was a nice oh, try. Wow. The answer is these are hard. These are hard questions. For products that contain marijuana. Wow, these are hard questions. Nice try. Let's try. Well, I know you're from Las uh, Vegas. I'm What's Brian you? Scott. I'm from the city of Las Vegas. All right. Well, thanks for thanks for coming. Uh, what is an ergo lick lick drug? Is that how you pronounce it? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. You can't say it. You can't ask it. <laughs> it's E R G O L Y T I C. Ergo lictic. Ergolytic. Ergolytic. Okay. What is an ergolytic drug? A, a drug that enhances exercise capacity and or athletic performance. B, a drug that impairs exercise uh, capacity and or athletic performance. C, a drug that helps with pain symptoms. Or D, none of the above. C. Unfortunately, you have been weeded oh. out, but it was a nice <laughs> try. Thank you for playing. So, so we have one more representative from Las Vegas here. What's your name? Uh, oh, what was the answer? Oh, I didn't give it. Sorry. It, it is B. A drug that impairs exercise capacity and or athletic performance, ergolytic. There we go. Learning something new. See, we're all learning something new today. Um, That's I what these cards are for. So Darcy is the last Las Vegas representative. Uh, uh, Darcy, thanks for coming to the sure. conference. Um, who introduced cannabis sativa plants to the Americas? A, Australian explorers. B, British explorers. C, Incan explorers, or D, Spanish explorers. So A, Australian, B, British, C, Incan, or D, Spanish. Take a guess. I'm going to go with B. Unfortunately, you have to wait <laughs> out. The answer is D. It was Spanish explorers. But thank you for volunteering and playing. We appreciate it. So we're down to our final three. We're going to get you guys some boards here. You're going to write your answers on the boards. Uh. And you won't need the mic anymore because you're just going to show you where you're going you're to put your answers at. All right. Can you explain the difference between the two levels? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, there's the difference. The difference in levels is there's there's difficult there's difficult there's easier ones which you heard. These guys got the easy questions. They got the they kind of got the free pass. Sorry, everyone who lost got weeded out. But but uh, these are high 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 stakes cards. So there's some that are going to be easier. And this game is it gets harder as you go. So it's not. Just, it's not just supposed to be just easy, as you can tell. You're learning a little bit. But, and you can, you can change it up in how you play. You can just play with the hard questions, or you can play with the easier questions. So if you're playing with younger youth who, who aren't going to know about Incan Explorers, you, know, you, can, you can actually give, give an opportunity. And they're still, they're still getting an opportunity to learn about marijuana and learn the facts about marijuana so they can make good choices. Uh, so, sorry, tell me your name one more time. Kelly. Kelly. We got Kelly here. Okay, so... In what year? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, we're going to ask all three. I'm going to get this wrong. We're down to the final three. What we're going to do is I want you to put your answer on your. Don't don't let anyone look. You got to hide it. And so so I want you to put your answer uh, on here. What we're going to do is we're going to get down to the final two, and then we're going to do the final one. Okay. So we're going to see who gets this right here. Uh, in what year was medical marijuana legalized in Colorado? A 2000. B 
B, 2006, C, 2013, or D, 2014? I won't hum Jeopardy music. Everyone ready to give it a shot? All right, show us your answer. Show the camera your answers. All right, so you have 2006, 2000, and 2014. The answer is A, 2000. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to do, we're going to do a round off to see which one of you two go to the final. So you're going to set out this one, and we're going to do it real quickly. Uh, uh, let's kind of get, that's too hard. You guys know where you're going to get that one. <laughs> uh, OK, well, this, this one, you'll get a guess here. Uh, how much THC is in hemp? according to Colorado laws. Is it A, none, B, less than 1%, C, less than 5%, or D, less than 10%? All right, show me your answers. And the answer is B, less than 1%. And so, oh, thank you for playing. We got to the final two now. And we, and I'm gonna get you a gift card in a minute, but you hang by here. So we're, gonna, we're down to the final two. Uh, we're gonna see who's gonna be our, high, our uh, cards here. These are the high stakes cards. We're going to a whole different level. I don't know how you get wow. harder level than that. <laughs> All right. So this is for the championship. I never know what it's like being Alex Trebek, but now I do, I guess. All right. So uh, what you're going to do is you're going to write your answers now. This is the third level. And so it's not A, B, C, or D. You actually have to take a guess. We're not even going to give you a, a guess on these ones. Uh, so, so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you this question, whoever, which one of you get the most right? And this was as of, what year was this when these cards were written? These were fall of 2017. So this has changed because it changes every five minutes with legalization. So I'm going to make, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make this, you're going to have to take a guess. But so this is taken back a little bit. So, so it make it a little harder for you. Which eight states uh, have legalized retail marijuana as of fall of 2017? But just this past fall, how many states had legalized marijuana? For adult use. For adult use, yes. Retail. Okay, audience, you're going to have to help me when you look at these and see how many they got right when I name these off. Who gets it, who gets it right? <laughs> And I'll give you a hint just to make it easier. There's eight. <laughs> Are you ready? All right, let's turn around your answers. Show them to the, show them to the TV cameras in the audience. OK, the answers are, as of fall 2017, Alaska. Do either of you have Alaska? You have Alaska? You have Alaska? So we have some smart ladies up here. California, yeah. underline it if you have California, both of you too. Colorado, wow, these ladies are smart. Uh, Maine. Maine, you have Maine? No, Maine. neither of them have Maine. Okay. Massachusetts, uh, Nevada, Nevada. 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 Oregon, yeah. and Washington State. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, six, you have? Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii's not right. Well, yeah, no, DC is not a state, so it's not a state. state. And you have how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> oh, no, I, I said DC. DC. I know Hawaii's a state. Yes, I know. I'm aware of that. Beautiful state. Right here. Hawaii's a medical, right? Yeah, yeah. You have legalized recreational. Yes. I don't make it sound like it's other way. Yes, great state. Uh, anyway, uh, so it looks like Lydia is the winner. Did you win her? You have seven? Uh, congratulations. <laughs> All right, thank you, ladies. Please hang back after the thing. We'll get you your gift cards. And thank you for playing. And thank you for everyone who played. All right, we have just a few. We have about 15 minutes left. And uh, this is where I was asking the questions. Now you can put us on the spot, guys. And you can ask some questions. And we're going to pass around the mic here if you have any questions for any of us. Uh, once, once again, uh, Jessica's from the city of Denver. Daniel is from, I'm sorry, from the state of Colorado. And you have Daniel from the city of Denver for the uh, Denver Public Schools. And I'm from Denver's Excise and Licenses. And so we're happy to try to answer any questions. Just had a quick question. What do you, what do you order that game? 
How, how can you order that game? Unfortunately, uh, we don't we don't have it available because it's only for Denver school kids. Oh, okay. So, so uh, but, but we, we can share what we like how we made it. Oh, that'd be great. Yes. Be great. Yeah, we'd be happy to. Absolutely. Oh, fine. <laughs> not very tall. Hi, uh, Kimberly Lavoie from Canada. With respect to your competitive grants process, one of my questions is, and we run into this often in Canada, is that sometimes your highest needs communities ne do not necessarily have the skills to actually write the proposals needed to get the funding from the grant process. So how would you mitigate that to ensure that the highest needs communities actually get the funds they need to be able to access the programming. Yeah, so it's almost not really even a marijuana prevention question. It's a larger, like, supportive grant process. Yeah, we've been working with that a lot in the city and county of Denver. We have about 10 programs who we've always been able to fund because they're really competitive grant writers, right? Um, what we've been doing is just facilitating workshops at this point. Before we have a competitive process, we'll do a workshop then we'll do the Q&A, but obviously at a certain point we can no longer get feedback because we are the reviewers. Um, so I, I would like to follow up with you and give you like just really the deck and the agenda for our workshop um, because short of giving them the funds to write the grant itself, there's very little that we can do um, in regards to technical assistance. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great question though. I would also share, Colorado has a very strong um, nonprofit network. Um, the Colorado Nonprofit Association is a fantastic resource here that I would recommend other um, communities look to having a similar structure uh, of support for advocacy for nonprofit um, related topics, uh, training, um, particularly for grant writing and support and how to implement programs. Um, State and city level grants are not an easy process. Um, the paperwork and time involved is outrageous. So um, part of that is our job is to um, help mitigate some of that by um, taking on the burden of the paperwork and maybe ensuring that we are supporting um, those grantees and community partners to do the work that they are the experts in and help them along the way as, as for coaching predominantly. Hi, Maddie Golickson from Colorado Springs. And um, I know you guys were talking a little bit about segmenting your audience, especially when it comes to youth. So some of this seems to be focused more on youth that already might have goals um, or have an interest in say college or something like that. Do you have a, a proposal or a way to talk to students who maybe don't have goals in their lives or um, aren't making college that priority? Thank you. What an expansive question. Um, thank you. So we do have, I believe, Charlie, if you're still in the back of the room, there he is. Um, this is really the individual from the city and county of Denver, Charlie Garcia, correct? Charlie Garcia, who would um, be your best point of contact for that? It's true. After school programs are best suited to youth who are already kind of in the quote unquote system. They're already school engaged, they're already school informed, they have a support system that allows them to be um, active in their community, it allows them to be an active part of an after school community. So the truth is, and I, I, I'm very honest about this, after school works for about 90% of the population of youth in Denver. Those other 10% are best served by other community programs. And Charlie, if you could follow up, you could explain all of the great stuff that you're doing over there. Uh, I would also say, um Part of our messaging is uh, our youth campaign is find your moment, and it's it's not these big moments really. It's about what are these small moments that happen um, in your day to day, in an in interaction, you know, hanging out with your friends, going to the mall, talking, you know, with your parents uh, at school, at the soccer field. Like, what are these small moments that really can be the catalyst to something? And how do we, as adults, help and inform that and dedicate funding and time and skill building towards that, that we help them build those moments and help them build upon recognizing those moments so that then that can become something that they adhere to. I'm sorry, I lost where the person is. That's just. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Brian Scott, City of Las Vegas. It was interesting to see your map and, and hear you talk about the communities with the least opportunities have the most marijuana facilities. In a city like Las Vegas, it's a lot different because we have a large tourist community. It seems like all of the facilities are kind of aiming toward the tourists and a lot less toward the, the youth. Is your program geared toward the youth, is that something that's part of the school curriculum or is that something like an after school type of program? So, so the city and county of Denver does have a relationship with Denver Public Schools. My program that I showed you earlier is really about after school programs okay. in particular. And not every program in the city and county of Denver, every after school program is gonna provide that curricula. It's obviously not appropriate for a third grader, sure. right? We aim at that middle school population. So our grant stipulations are really only for mi um, those programs that serve middle school youth. Mm. Um, your question around, uh, it was a really good point, your question around marijuana facility location is a little bit different in the, in the context of Las Vegas, I would say, is that really the social norming factor that it is in Denver? Right. Um, you seem to be suggesting that maybe it isn't. And it, it, that well, that's where they seem to be locating. Every, yeah. every facility we get, be it uh, well, it's the dispensaries, right. are all kind of gearing toward the resort corridor. Right. And the areas where we have the youth with lease opportunities, you don't see very many facilities there, but it's going to spread to them eventually. So it'd be nice for them to be educated on exactly what they could encounter um, as it progresses. So. Yeah. Can we follow up after this? Sure, that'd be great. Thank great, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I just have a quick question, and I came in late, so if you address this, I apologize. So um, as a parent of three, I have a terminology issue with recreational versus adult use. So as a panel, what, what is your take on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we actually refer to it as retail marijuana because we don't want you recreating while you're using it. Um, <laughs> but um, to differentiate between medical marijuana, and it is also referred to as adult use marijuana. I think they are, can be very one and the same. When we look at medical marijuana in Colorado, um, as a young person, somebody under the age of 18, you can access medical marijuana um, for a number of um, health issues. Predominantly what it's used for, there's about, I think 150. Um, young people in Colorado who um, access medical marijuana for seizures um, and severe pain. So it, it's, it is used for medical purposes and to differentiate that from adult use or retail, um, I think is equally as acceptable. Um, personally, what I would like to move to is cannabis, um, but it's not wholly accurate here in Colorado as cannabis actually is marijuana and hemp. Um, but really thinking about what are the implications of the language we use about this can have um, wide-reaching effects on how we perceive this in our communities. So thank you for that. Any other questions? That's it, huh? Hi, so I'm Katie from Canada, and my question is about um, essentially role clarity, and so law enforcement's look to a lot of the time to provide education on a, a wide variety of issues, so was there that tension in Denver that you found, or you feel that like role clarity was pretty straightforward, or did you guys help manage community expectations around that? Uh, in any way, shape, or form. Well, it really depends on what, what education you're talking about. Uh, as we've talked about throughout this conference, our coordinated approach, so we make sure there's no, we, we really work hard to not have any tension so we can communicate to each other. We actually have a bi-weekly meeting with all the different agencies in Denver that have some role in managing marijuana. So we can uh, identify any issues that might be coming up, challenges that they're facing, and education is one of those issues. Uh, one of the challenges we have going forward here in the city of Denver is uh, not just with children's education, but adult education mm -hmm. and uh, home grows and what's legal and what is not legal. So we're working with our police department uh, to make sure to see what they're seeing uh, and so we can make sure and address those issues in our uh, public campaigns so we can hopefully make their job easier and also make sure the public knows what is legal and what is not legal when it comes to uh, what the rules are to growing at home. I would add from the state perspective, one of the ways we've mitigated that is um, actually to bring our stake, all of our stakeholders to the table. So working with the governor's office, working with public health, working with enforcement, but also working with industry. 
Um, and which, when we look at the history of public health being, oh my God, there's no way we would bring tobacco to the table, why are we doing this for marijuana? It looks very different um, here in our state. Our marijuana industry partners have been very good partners at the table, are interested in public health, are interested in mitigating, um, you know, Want, don't want to bring in law enforcement unnecessarily, want to make sure that they're following the rules and regulations, and also want to make sure that the, the way that we talk about marijuana in our communities also is reflective of how they see it from their perspective. And so having all of those folks at the table has mitigated a lot of those tensions so that we can talk pretty directly about them. Um, public health and, and law enforcement often can be at odds. Um, and we have very different perspectives about approaches to um, you know, prevention, education, and enforcement, uh, but being able to bring each other along the way, um, see each other's perspective, honestly, it sounds very wooey and hippy-dippy, but has made gone a long way to, for us to be able to work together and set that stage from the beginning um, and build trust from the beginning that we can lean on that and rely on that as it comes to those hard times of tension. Hi everybody, so my name is Charlie. I'm with the Office of Behavioral Health Strategy. So I oversee all the youth diversion programming. So as of right now, Denver, uh, well my office, oversees eight programs ranging from the Boys and Girls Club, which is a program that uh, instead of kids being suspended or expelled, they go to this program for about 15 uh, sessions, but they follow up throughout the whole year regarding uh, to make sure they're on track and doing well. I also oversee some of uh, the criminal justice um, programs. Well, I don't oversee them, but uh, we help fund them. So an example would be the HYPE program, which is helping youth pursue uh, excellence, I believe it is. And so that program's an in-day program rather than an after school, which is what you guys are hearing with the prevention. So if you guys have any questions regarding uh, more in detail, I can provide more of that as well. Thank you very much for chiming in. I really appreciate it. Now, we have a couple more minutes left, and I thought I would ask a couple of questions. This is a rather questions, and I thought I would start with one of the ones that I think, uh, as you guys are preparing your youth campaigns and, and figuring out how you're going to educate your youth, is uh, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges uh, we face. And I can tell you from the city of Denver's perspective, from our marketing campaign, uh, to try to get information out there, it's been getting uh, some of this education in schools. Um, and that, unfortunately, uh, I don't know if, uh, if some of you are as old as me or older, you might remember there was a challenge with sex ed back in the day, where parents thought that if you taught kids about sex, guess what, they were going to have sex. Uh, and that's kind of the same thing we've encountered with marijuana, is that a lot of parents believe that uh, if you teach kids about marijuana, uh, then they'll want to uh, do marijuana. So we're still trying to work through those challenges and trying to solve them. We haven't solved them yet. Uh, but we're trying to learn, and hopefully, uh, uh, if you have some ideas, we'll be happy to share this with you. How about you two? What are some of the biggest challenges you're facing and obstacles you're trying to overcome, and maybe some examples of how you've overcame them? Yeah, I think your example is a really good one. I thought that we would come into some resistance using marijuana tax revenue to support after-school programs. This has not been the case. We've received very, very positive community support. And your question around parents is, is a really funny one. I have a, a quick anecdote to share. I went out and visited a program where we were doing the Healthy Lifestyles curricula for middle school um, kiddos who are in those grant-funded programs. They go through a 10-hour curricula. Um, I was really surprised to learn that the parents had actually gotten so interested that they started to come to the after-school program and that they wanted to be a partner with their kids in learning this. And that was in one of our most underserved community. They really wanted the information. So our biggest challenge so far is that we have so many audiences and so little time. How about you, Jess? That's a hard one, Eric. Um, I think one of our biggest challenges, I think, has been actually perception of um, mass media and social marketing campaigns are an incredible tool to ensure that you are speaking to a large audience and a broad audience about very specific things. But it's only one tool. Um, a lot of the work that we do is very, it's less flashy, it's a lot harder. Um, it, it, it's a lot of conversations, it's a lot of sitting around the table. Um, so some of our biggest challenges has been uh, to ensure that the partners that we work with and the people that we are trying to reach with our messages know that you, c you can't just have one component. Really thinking about layering on what these looks like, what this looks like. So policy, 
uh, plus education, plus prevention, plus peer-to-peer, -peer, plus you know, this mass marketing campaign really is the way to set that stage and set that environment. It seems very daunting and overwhelming to think about how we're gonna do all of these things, um, but being able to lean on our partners and advocate with each other of why we are speaking the same language, how we are speaking the same language, and the importance of making sure that we are layering on this approach, not only in schools, but in communities um, and at a state level to ensure that public health and health is in all of our policies and in all of our efforts. I think that has been one of the biggest challenges and also a strength of Colorado um, is being able to you know, share that those, some of those common goals. And I, and I want to remind you, Jessica, she's worked, uh, been a key part of a state survey called Healthy Kids Colorado, and it is outstanding. I'm bragging about it. I don't work for the state of Colorado, for the city of Denver, <laughs> and I would encourage you to Google that Healthy Kids Colorado and see how they've looked at marijuana usage in Colorado. It might be something, a good example for, for your state uh, to follow if you're from a state agency uh, to see how you really measure that, because that's one of the, also one of the big challenges, I think, is that there's not enough data and not enough health information. And so uh, I think not just in Colorado, but everywhere has legalized marijuana, wouldn't you say? I would absolutely say that. That's definitely, you know, one of the biggest questions we get is, how is this impacting youth? And um, how is this, you know, where is all the money going? <laughs> are two of the biggest questions that we get. And so when we think about how is this impacting youth, um, again, like I said before, if you don't have that data in front of you, it's a very difficult conversation to have. Um, as well as how do you communicate um, information from epidemiologists and data wants to um, <laughs> all the rest of us, uh, and making sure that that is clear. Um, it's, it's very easy to take a, a data point and misconstrue it um, to support you know, whatever um, agenda you have. So making sure that you're controlling that message about what the data is actually saying. Um, and though we do see you know, differences in numbers between 19% and 20%, that actually is not an increase or decrease. It's not statistically significant. That doesn't mean much to the rest of us, but it means a lot to, to, us, to us when we think about what are the impact this is having on our young people. Um, I would say, and the reason we're able to do that, to dedicate that funding, is dedicating um, tax cash dollars from the state directly to prevention, education, and to support these efforts. There's our number one recommendations to other communities and states to think about this not, doesn't just go in a general fund, because um, it'll very, very quickly be eaten up by making sure your bridges aren't collapsing, right? Which is also a big priority, but to ensure that um, you're mitigating any unwanted negative effects of legalization through uh, supporting prevention, education, and public health priorities as well. Well, we, we're out, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I just want to remind all of you, first of all, we really appreciate you all attending. And also, we, we pride ourselves on being friendly in Colorado. So uh, if, you, if you leave this conference, you have more questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We really want to try to be helpful to you. That's why we hold this conference. But just because you leave this conference doesn't mean we're not going to answer a phone. We'd be happy to try to help you in any way we can. And uh, also, don't forget to keep an eye out for the, uh, the email you're going to get uh, later today as far as asking you to uh, evaluate this uh, whole conference because we want to hear your input and we want to make it better every year. But uh, it couldn't happen without you guys coming out here in attendance. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy your rest of your day. Thank you.